dall'Institute for the Future di California viene Tim West. Prego. Ciao, Tim. Ciao grazie mille. Ciao. Ciao. It's very nice to be here. Uh, my name is Tim West. I'm the founder of the Food Hackathon and Forum coming in from San Francisco, California. Uh, I also come here uh, as a chef, as a, um, a, a food hacker, uh, and also a global citizen dedicated to building a better world, uh, a tastier world, a healthier world, and a more equitable world. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the future of food revolution. And uh, it's, it's, for me, it's about kind of the coming together of the maker movement and the hacker movement uh, for this cause. Uh, I'm also aware that I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'm not going to take as much time as I need. But uh, before we uh, talk about the future, I want to go back and talk a little bit about the past and talk about the Green Revolution. So the Green Revolution really was born out of World War II. It was this time when there was a bunch of excess nitrogen that from making bombs that was used to grow food. It was, it, it was uh, discovered that if you put this excess nitrogen on plants, it makes them grow faster. So it was really born at this, uh, what we now call conventional farming, this corn and wheat and soy, um, uh, you know, started growing in these giant monocultures. And that's what gave us the birth of convenience foods and fast foods and, and processed foods and TV dinners. So it was actually uh, that kind of value proposition that was shifting after the war when women had gone to the workforce in the US and they wanted their time back that this became a, a, a value that uh, was at least born within the US. But as we sat down to TV in the United States, over the last couple of decades, we've seen the rise of celebrity chefs. So uh, Mario Batali, Rachel Ray, um, uh, these are just a few here in the States. I, I really wish that um, Massimo Bertura had a television show, I'd be watching it. But I, I think what this did is it catalyzed such a curiosity around food and a desire to want to learn to cook. And um, there's a great book out there by uh, Eve Tarot, and she talks about this taste of Generation Yum, specifically about how millennials are really passionate about food, and it's my belief that it's partly inspired by a lot of this television and these celebrity chefs, that their curiosity has grown. I know at least it was for me. But she also talks a little bit about these digital natives, about people that have grown up with all of this information and technology and this digital stimulation, and she talks about how it's made us anxious. And, I bl and she talks about how this anxiety is partly driving this desire to take photos of our food, to demonstrate our power, to really control what it is we put in our own bodies. And I find it fascinating because I think it's also that same desire for control that is partly fueling this really drive for the maker movement. And it was great for me because uh, as I got on the plane, I grabbed the, issue of, the current issue of Make Magazine, and this is all about the food movement. Uh, I learned a lot. I'd highly encourage you to, to go out and get it. And uh, it talks about right in the beginning that food is probably one of the most overlooked of the kind of angles of the, the maker movement. And we can all clearly see how big and powerful the maker movements become thanks to magazines and maker fairs. And um, I really think that it's, uh, you know, it, I, I discovered that there was this whole idea of the zero to maker and maker to maker and maker to market. That, that was inside the magazine. And as we start to look uh, at some of those examples within the food world, I think Instructables is a really great example of this kind of zero to maker, this j beginning and, and entry for people to get into the maker movement. And it's in, in Instructables, bought by Autodesk, that food is such a really huge component to, this, uh, to the website. So if we look at another example in the kind of more maker to maker, this is actually uh, emerging, it's a, a platform called BarnRaiser, really meant to create that connection between food makers and food makers to help them through crowdfunding, through learning, through finding resources. And I'm starting to see that and hoping that we start to see a lot more of this kind of maker to maker and maker to market emerging within the food world the way it has in, in the maker world. So this is actually uh, an, a friend of mine from San Francisco, uh, Lisa Federer, um, she you know, decided she wanted to learn to cook, and then she made this really cool device. You guys may have seen it. It's a thermal immersion circulator known as the Nomiku, uh, now digitally connected. And she talks about 
uh, or, and she promotes people learning to cook, and it makes it as easy to kind of become a, a prof cook professional food as a chef. But let's take a step back for a second. Uh, who here has had food poisoning before? One, two, three, quite a few. You'll never forget that, will you? <laughs> so for me, the first time I got food poisoning, I was 18 years old. I was at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and I realized I had grown up to be 18 years old in the United States from New York, and I had never learned to cook. I had never learned where my food came from, and it just blew my mind. How was I allowed to become this old, having no idea where to, where to, uh, how to cook or where my food came from? So that inspiration, this food poisoning, is what drove me to actually go to culinary school. I went to the Culinary Institute of America, and I spent about 10 years cooking. I actually came out here in 2008 for uh, the um, Terra Madre, uh, which was hugely inspiring, and I kind of vowed to go back to the United States and instigate a food revolution. And part of my other inspiration was this guy. So this guy is my grandfather, actually. This is Arch West, and he's the founder of Doritos. And uh, as, as I began to learn more about the food world, I, I discovered this book. It's called The Dorito Effect. And it talks about how Doritos was really one of those breakout products, processed food products back in the 50s, that found that magical bliss point, that combination of salt and fat and sugar that made food so craving, so, so addicting that people couldn't stop. So as I started to learn and grow, I ended up here. I ended up actually cooking at Facebook. And uh, this is actually, funny enough, Katy Perry uh, eating at my nacho bar. I think she liked it. And um, it's not Facebook that I wanted to talk about, it's what I learned at Facebook and what I discovered, which is this model of hackathons. So for me, the startup bus was the first hackathon that I was invited to. I couldn't develop anything, I couldn't even make it look pretty, I'm not a designer, but I came in with this idea to create a custom cereal company. And it was m more fun than anything else, it was kind of a joke that got out of control. But we ended up making all of these uh, fake cereal boxes, and we ended up winning the, one of the largest startup food ha or hackathon competitions in the United States. And all of a sudden, I had this kind of idea, what would happen if I was to kind of combine this hackathon movement that we had been using at Facebook to birth new ideas, and what if we were to try and reposition a lot of Silicon Valley's energy and enthusiasm and intelligence towards building a better food system, and this is what happened. We are here to learn, to share, to collaborate, to ideate. We are here to do good, to have fun, and to make friends. Welcome the Food Hackathon and Forum. We have folks from the tech sector, designers and developers, people coming from university, people with science backgrounds, people from the food startup world, just meeting each other for the first time, getting together in a room and just going for it. Throughout this weekend, we're going to participate in this marathon of hacking of building, of creating, of prototyping, taking ideas to reality that improve the food system. If anything's ever gonna change, everybody needs to be at the table. The new generation of food entrepreneurs should have a lot of vision and responsibility. They need to think about the way to produce food in a sustainable way and to produce food that is nutrition. People don't know what they're putting in their bodies. Even if they think they're eating healthy, sometimes they're not doing it. And it's a matter of getting information into people's hands. And I think technology is the way to enable that. And so if we could make people understand that the food they eat is so much a part of the health that's going to last them their entire lives, then that would be a great breakthrough. What's great about a hackathon is it's kind of like organized serendipity. It brings together a lot of people with common interests and common values and puts them together in kind of a concentrated space for two and a half days to work on solving a problem together. 
Today we are creating a food and drug interaction safety app that tells you what foods to eat and what foods to avoid while on medication. And every now and then something magical happens and an idea actually turns into a company. So these were the winners of the last hackathon. And uh, I've been very fortunate. It was uh, when I came actually back here to Bologna, I, I came, uh, I met Sarah Reversi and Andrea Magelli of the UCAN group, and they wanted to do these hackathons here. And it's funny because Bologna is the other side of my family. My, my mother's family is from Bologna. And once I started uh, following the Italians, I started to really um, kind of come to life in terms of what the possibilities. So over the last uh, four years, three years actually, um, together with the Future Food Institute, we've launched the Fu Future Food Institute together. We've launched the Food Innovation Program. So uh, the Future Food Institute dedicated to building out this global ecosystem of responsible businesses and also the Food Innovation Program, a master's in food innovation. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I get this question, like, what is the future of food all the time? But the really, the answer is the future of food is what we make of it. And this is, I think, one great example of where we're going. Um, I'd really love to hear that Intel was talking about applying technology to herding cattle. Um, this is GE that actually has a maker space out of Louisville, Kentucky. It's called First Build, and it's a place that people can come together and hack hardware for the kitchen and beyond. And this is an example of one of the types of technologies that's emerging. So uh, Pico Brew gives you the opportunity to kind of make any beer and set any recipe into it. So imagine pretty soon I'm going to be able to send you here in Rome a Sierra Nevada, kind of like 3D printing a beer, and you're going to be able to send me back a Peroni. Now, that's cool and all, but this, this is really cool. This is inside of the Make Magazine, the current food edition. And this is a uh, green Bronx machine. So not far from where I grew up, the Bronx was a place full of gangs. It was uh, a food desert. And now this is happening. So this is uh, a program where they have students actually learning where their food comes from. They're actually cook or growing their food 365 days a year. They're growing food in New York. And uh, what they're finding is that as kids have learned about food, they're getting more interested in schooling. They actually have 45% increase in test scores in science in the schools that these uh, programs are in. And they have a 50% decrease in absentees. So this is the kind of technology that's going to prevent people from having the same kind of problem I had. Um, and, and you know, the next question is like, what is, you know, is, so the future of food to me is fast. It's about new companies coming out, em embracing emerging technologies, blending the f maker movement and the hacker movement. And I think Obama does a really great job in the, uh, the next upcoming issue of Wired of describing how uh, AI is really going to transform our lives, but also where the big opportunity areas are. And this is one of my favorite quotes from um, the forward is, I believe we can work together to do big things that raise the fortunes of people here at home and all over the world. I still believe in science and technology is the warp drive that accelerates that kind of change for everybody. So, and uh, in that same spirit, I just want to close with an invitation. So this is uh, th our next event. This actually starts two weeks from today in San Francisco. And this idea really came to me to hack kids' health. And it came to me because I wanted to do something, particularly right before our elections, that was incredibly positive and constructive and collaborative beyond religion and international boundary to bring people together. I keep doing these events and, and working in this future of food space, but we really can't talk about the future anymore without talking about our kids and without making sure that they have the healthy life that we want. Um, and, and, and one last thing before I close, I wanted to also just issue this invitation. Um, anybody who wants to come, I want to make sure that we continue to blend this maker movement uh, in the food world and the hacker movement. So uh, I I'm going to take the first 10 tweets of the best reasons why you want to come to San Francisco to hack, and I'll give you free VIP tickets coming out to the hackathon. So uh, tweet at us, at Food Hackathon. And maybe we'll do a Food Makeathon soon. That's great. Congratulations. Yeah.